Hello, everyone. All right, today my, the title of my talk is going to be How to be ready for tomorrow's quantum attacks. So the outline will basically look at the capabilities of quantum computers, uh, which we need to, in order to understand how to protect against them. Uh, then we're going to see how quantum computers are going to affect the public key cryptography. And uh, also, we're going to discuss when do we actually need to be ready for quantum attacks. And then we're going to discuss some solutions to it. And then I'll give a brief introduction to post-quantum cryptography. And then, namely, we're going to concentrate on post-quantum elliptic curve cryptography. And then we're going to see how we can apply the post-quantum solutions to PKI and a brief conclusion. All right. So ongoing practical research and development paves the way for building large-scale quantum computers. And as we know today, small-scale quantum computers already exist. So a matter of building a large-scale one is just a matter of time because all the infrastructure, uh, all the techniques are there. It's just uh, takes, it's going to take some time to build a large-scale one. And uh, talking to physicists, uh, doing quantum mechanics, talking to some engineers, talking to some cryptographers, the general picture that we get is that the large-scale quantum computers are going to be available in about 15 to 20 years. And uh, now their computation power is much higher than that of the classical computers that are used today. And uh, which is very nice. I mean, that we're going to have a much more powerful computers. So our capabilities are going to increase. But it's not only us who are going to be using uh, those advantages, but the adversaries. So they're, which is going to let the quantum computers to actually be able to break today's crypto systems. So what are the capabilities of the quantum computers? Uh, they're going to be able to perform uh, certain computations much faster. And in some areas, it's really much, much faster. And by that, we mean if problem is exponential, i.e. we cannot solve it efficiently today, they might be able to solve some of those problems in polynomial running time. And one of the general things that they can do is search algorithms. They can perform them in a uh, approach, which is using Grover's algorithm. Uh, now, one great uh, capability of those quantum computers is factorization of integers and discrete logs. And discrete logs. Uh, and they, these can be performed in polynomial running time using Shor's algorithm. So that's you know, the greatest part of threat to cryptography today. Now, how does this affect cryptography? Well, if we look at the symmetric side, things are not that bad there. So we can only apply generic square root quantum search algorithms, which means in order to fix that, for symmetric part, we just need to double the key length, and we should be safe against quantum computers. Public key part, well, the story is totally different there. So schemes whose security is based on integer factorization, i.e. things like RSA, can be broken in quantum polynomial time. So the scheme is totally broken using quantum computer. Schemes based on discrete log problems can be broken in quantum polynomial time as well. So things like ECC, RSA, uh, which, or not ECC and any discrete log on generic group can be broken. So basically all of the currently standardized asymmetric, i.e. public key cryptography, is going to be efficiently broken by quantum adversaries. So all of that needs to be replaced. And there is uh, no easy fix uh, that would be similar to the symmetric cryptography. Because we have to take, uh, in principle, use totally different ideas here to be protected against quantum attacks. Now, some of you might question, well, quantum computers are coming in about 15, 20 years. Why should we worry about it today? And you know, there's a phrase saying that it's actually going to be too late to worry about it when the quantum computers are here. Uh, there's a number of reasons why we need to worry about it today. First of all, as practice shows, it takes some number of years to actually do the switch. And uh, also, for many products, the production cycle could be a decade or two. So if you start building something today, which should go in production in about 10, 20 years, uh, and you already use today's cryptography, well, the product might be great, but it's going to be totally vulnerable to all the attacks at the time it's actually going to be deployed. Uh, the messages that are encrypted using classical techniques today can actually be successfully decrypted using quantum techniques once the quantum computer is here. So sometimes you have some very uh, important information which you encrypt today using classical algorithms. Adversary might either record the traffic or it's going to be stored somewhere else. And once the quantum computers are here, they can just go back track and decrypt the messages. And you know, some messages need to be encrypted for 25 years. Some things could be, there might be need to do it for 70 years. And 
also another side of it is that, well, quantum we're saying 1520 years, but they actually might be here sooner than we expect. Or who knows, maybe some government agencies already have them. You know, given that NSA has already made an announcement that they want post-quantum protection, we have no idea what's exactly happening, what is not being told to us. So, and it could be possible the quantum computers will be readily available in five years. So it's always good uh, to be saved and sorry. All right, so what is the solution? I mean, this, some of the solutions being suggested is to use quantum algorithms against quantum adversaries. Well, it's a nice thing, but it's in theory at this point, we don't have quantum, quantum computers fully built right now. But well, once they're available, they're gonna start breaking things and by the time we actually deploy algorithms quantum computer, it's gonna be, take some time and we're gonna lose it. So therefore, we actually need classical cryptographic schemes that would be immune to quantum attacks. And this area of cryptography is called post-quantum cryptography. Now, post-quantum does not mean after quantum, it just means that once quantum computers are here, we still can use classical algorithms to protect against quantum attacks. That is, we can put in those algorithms today, but once quantum are here, we're still safe. Uh, now, as I mentioned, NIST is working on it. There's a call for proposals for post-quantum schemes. Uh, NSA is working on it. There's been also an announcement in regards to that on their website. And we're working on it, and we already have solutions. All right, what is post-quantum cryptography? Basically, there's five major sort of directions of trying to get solutions in that area. There's lattice-based cryptography, code-based systems, hash-based signatures, multivariate polynomials-based systems, and elliptic curve isogeny-based cryptography. All right, just briefly talking about these sort of five candidates, uh, we can sort of cross out code-based systems and multivariate polynomial-based systems because their key sizes are just hugely inefficient. And uh, the fact that uh, Sometimes you do slight modification those and they get totally broken, so we don't have much of a belief in their security. Hash-based signatures is actually a nice candidate, but only for signatures. It cannot do key exchange or public key encryption, so they can only be used for uh, signatures, and that's probably one of the things that's most likely gonna get standardized. Um, so another runner-up to elliptic curve isogeny-based cryptography, lattice-based cryptography, uh, things like NTRU, but the issue there is that when you try to define a uh, security level, like you can ask, well, what's the security that I'm getting? And the problem is that there's like five parameters which you need to juggle with and approximate the security. So you don't have a clear way of defining, saying that this scheme is actually gonna give you this much security. For example, we're used to saying, you know, for RSA or for ACC, for classical case, use this size of a prime and then you're fine. Same thing happens when we use elliptic isogeny for quantum resistant schemes, you want this much protection, we say, well, use this size of prime and you get, say, 128 quantum bit security. So it's much more clear and it's actually elliptic, because we're still within the elliptic curve scope, we can actually do nice easy drop in replacements, uh, which uh, work, uh, you know, very nicely integratable into current systems today. All right, now we're gonna get a little bit mathy here, I just wanna, <laughs> Uh, introduce what the isogenies are. Uh, if some of you are feeling that you're getting a little bit less, don't worry. I'm gonna have a slide where we're just gonna bring out the main points after it, but try to follow as much as you can for the next few slides. slides. So elliptic curves, what are elliptic curves? We're only gonna talk about elliptic curves over finite fields. That's what we need for practicability. Uh, so if we have a finite field and we have this cubic equation there, well, a solution to, a set of solutions over that field to that equation plus an additional point in infinity which serves an identity point forms our group. And how does the group law say if we want to use to add two points there, how do we do that? Well, here we can look at it geometrically. If we define, for instance, not over finite field but over just real integers, this blue thing is actually the elliptic curve geometrically. So if we're adding two points, say P and Q, well, we just draw a line through them. And, well, if you have a line and a cubic, then the number of points of intersection should be three. So there, it's gonna intersect at a third point. Once we get that third point, we reflect it in the x-axis, and that's the result of our sum. And we can write it out algebraically this way. So that's how the group law works, and it's closed under this group law addition. So this is a nice group with uh, quite a lot of good features. All right, so what are isogenies? So if any of you are familiar with group theory, Isogenies are basically a special case of homomorphism between groups. 
So if we have two elliptic curves in E prime, an isogeny between them is a non-constant algebraic morphism, has the following format where F1, F2, G1, G2 are just polynomials in X and Y. And it satisfies that it ma maps the identity point to identity. And because it's a homomorphism, we can get the sums uh, transferred throughout. Now, degree of the isogeny is degree is an algebraic map. And you usually just look at F1 polynomial. And whatever that degree is, that's the degree of this isogeny. All right, so this is basically, generally speaking, a mapping, a nice mapping that preserves uh, structural uh, properties of our curves. Now, the endomorphism ring, uh, we usually do denote it by end E, it's basically a set of isogenies, but the way to look at it is that we have, if two curves have an isogeny between them, their endomorphism rings are gonna be isomorphic, therefore we treat it as the same, Therefore, when we're talking about elliptic curve isogenies mapping between the curves, we can just say the endomorphism ring is the set of all these isogenies. All right, just an example of what an isogeny might look like. We can actually have an isogeny as simple as scalar multiplication. So scalar multiplication by n can be just taking point p and doing a scalar multiplication n times p. And for example, when n is equal to, this is how this looks. Now, if you notice, these equations are actually quite involved, especially if you know, we're doing more complicated isogenies. So in fact, we, used, was, we use isogenies more in an indirect way using the kernel. And this is what we're gonna look at uh, in a few slides there as well. All right, there's two types of curves. There's ordinary and super singular. Now, super singular has nothing to do with singular curves. It's just uh, uh, coincidence that you know, it has a substring of a name in it. So the theory is that all the curves, if you take any curve, it's gonna be either ordinary or super singular. There's no third option. Now, if we look at this endomorphism ring, again, the set of these isogenies, it's either gonna have dimension two or dimension four. In the case when it's dimension two, it's commutative. When it's dimension four, it's non-commutative. And just as a sort of running a little bit ahead, non-commutativity for quantum computers is a killer. Quantum computers can do much with non-commutative structures. So for today's cryptography, uh, because we're using discrete log-based schemes, we use ordinary curves which have, and the morphism has dimension two. But for post-quantum solutions, we're actually gonna use super singular curves. They're not good candidates for discrete logs, but they're great candidates for isogeny-based schemes. And the nice feature is that, some my question, well, how do you prove that we don't actually go from between ordinary super singular back and forth you, because isogeny is a mapping. Well, in fact, everything works out nice. If we start off with a one type of curve and we take any isogeny mapping from it, we're gonna stay within the same class. So either we're gonna be mapping between ordinary or super singular curves. We're never gonna be jumping out of that area. All right, as I mentioned, isogeny is in their explicit way, the way you write them as a bunch of polynomials, it's very inefficient to display it that way. Therefore, we need to use kernels. Now, a kernel, if we have a mapping uh, from the original group and all the points that go to uh, identity point in that group is basically, they set up like a subgroup and which we call a kernel. Now, if we grab any subgroup of our, of our original elliptic curve, then there is gonna exist an isogeny with kernel equal to that subgroup. And degree of that isogeny and the size of that are gonna coincide and so that's why we can actually denote the image from group theory E mod K. So now the major idea to bring out is that instead of isogenies directly, we can actually use their kernels, which are nice subgroups. And in fact, those kernels, we're gonna actually use them in an even more efficient way. The fact that you can actually just grab a point and see what subgroup this point generates by taking all the scalar multiples of that point. And this point is actually gonna be related to our isogeny there. And that degree of the isogeny is going to be n. And now we're just going to use some Vilus formulas, standard elliptic curve arithmetic formulas to compute that isogeny. All right. We're almost over with all this hardcore mathematical stuff. <laughs> all right. So for elliptic curve defined over a finite field, we define an m torsion subgroup. Basically, it's a set of all points such that m times that point is actually gonna give you the identity point. So order of that point is gonna be either M or it's gonna divide into M. Uh, now, this major idea is to bring out is that this M torsion subgroup is integers mod M in dimension two. 
And so that's why we picked the primes to be of the following format here. So these LA and LB are actually small primes, and small we mean really small, like two and three or two and five or something along these lines. And now these exponents are gonna be big ones. So we pick it this way, F is just some cofactor, and that's and we generate so such this one is gonna be a prime. Now we take this prime and define find a field over the quadratic extension of it, fp squared. Now, because this structure is a two-dimensional, that's why for each basis of these things, we're going to have two points in there to generate it. Okay? Now, the question is, well, how do we know if two curves are actually have an isogeny between them? This answer is actually very easy. If we count the size of these groups, if they're the same and they're defined over the same finite field, then there is an isogeny. Now, what that isogeny is, is a hard problem. Okay? All right, so if anybody got lost throughout this mathematical part here, we're gonna actually bring out the major points that, need, that we need to continue on with the talk. So, it's actually easy to figure out if two curves have an isogeny between them, but hard to find that isogeny. Uh, and we only use super singular optic curves, as they're more secure for uh, post-quantum protection. Now, isogeny is because they're group homomorphism, we have this nice property. If we take an isogeny of a point, of like two points divided, multiplied by some scalars, well, because this is a group homomorphism, we can actually break it up like this. And we can actually go further because these things are scalars. We can bring this out of isogeny and we're gonna get this. So we can play around with these manipulations between mappings. And because working with isogeny is directly is involved, we work with the kernel of the isogenies which we can represent as just one elliptic curve point. So basically, if we start thinking, well, how do we represent our isogeny? It's just one elliptic curve point, so it's much simpler in practice than it might look in theory. And uh, we let k to be the corresponding kernel point of the isogeny, and then we denote the mapping from E to our image curve E prime on this way. And our prime has to be of this structural form. All right, any questions at this point? All right. Yeah. All right, so what is the underlying hard problem here? So if we have two isogenous elliptic curves, E and E prime, the hard problem is find that isogeny between them. And for super single elliptic curves, this problem is fully quantum exponential, so it's unbreakable by quantum computers. The best they can do is square root, square root, uh, root, root six attack, which is fully exponential. Okay, so now getting this more into infrastructure of PKI, well, how do the keys look in these structures? So, I mean, our scheme's public parameters, there's gonna be elliptic curve E and finite field, standard stuff, and then we're gonna have the bases. Remember, we need two pieces and bases, two points in each basis here, and we have two bases because we have small prime LA and small prime LB, like two and three or something like that. And now, user A decides to use, chooses which bases they're gonna be using. Well, user A, which is gonna be bases PA, QA. So these are just elliptic curve points. And what the user A is gonna do is gonna select two integers, MA and NA. So these are gonna be the secret integers. And then, what the user is gonna do, some elliptic curve arithmetic, doing MA times PA plus NA times QA. So this is just an elliptic curve point, which now is used as an isogeny, kernel of our isogeny. And so this part uh, is the image curve under that isogeny. And then also what user A is gonna do is evaluate the isogeny on the basis for the other user. So we're gonna look at the image of PB and QB under that isogeny. And so if we narrow it down to see, well, what, what is the private key? Private key is just two integers. And what is the public key? Public key is an elliptic curve and two elliptic curve points. All right, how does the key agreement happen? Well, let's just uh, look at, well, what does A have? Just, uh, so A has private integers and public parameters. Curve, two points. B, same thing, two private integers curve and two points. And they exchange their public parameters. So what does A do here? 
So using B's public points and A's own private integers, what A does, grabs those two points that uh, B has provided and computes this value here. Again, standard elliptic curve arithmetic is happening here. And now let's look at what this thing is actually working out to. If we, what A is actually computing, if A computes this, but remember B1 and B2 are images of A's basis points under Bob's isogeny, so let's just replace it with these things. Now, because this is an isogeny and these are scalars, we can bring them inside. So if we put those inside, and again, because isogeny is a homomorphism property, we can just combine them into one. But this is actually the point relating to isogeny of A. Well, we just put it under image of Bob, Bob's isogeny. And so, using uh, this value, A is gonna map from Bob's public curve to this curve over here using that isogeny that she, this point that she has computed. Now notice this could be actually equivalent to set as E modded out by her public key and Bob's, uh, her private key and Bob's private key here. And then they're gonna compute the J invariant of the image curve. J invariant is just the property of curves, so any isomorphic curves are gonna have the same J invariant. This is just to avoid some ambiguities. Well, what does B do? B does exactly the same thing except he uses uh, A's public parameters and his private parameters, and he ends up same way here with his kernel point under A's uh, isogeny. And he's gonna map here, and observation happens here. He gets the same thing, but except, if you notice, the only difference is that here we have KB, KA, here we have K, KB, and they compute the J invariant of the resulting curve. Well, let's look at the relationship. So A has obtained this curve, and B has obtained this curve, but these uh, generators actually generate the same subgroups. This means that these two curves are the same curves. And again, we're saying up to isomorphism, we just assume that if they have exactly the same structures, then they are the same curves. Isomorphisms are efficiently computable. But this means that the J invariants are actually the same, and that's the common key that they establish in their key exchange. And just looking at this more pictorialist diagram, so this is the public curve everybody knows and everybody starts, say like system parameters. A computes her isogeny here, Bob computes it here, they publish their curves, they publish these images, then Bob grabs A's public parameters and his private parameters and maps it to this curve. A does the same thing, goes here, uses private, uh, public uh, parameters of Bob, her own private parameters, maps it to here, but these end up being the same curves. And so that's what's used for the common key establishment. You can also do public key encryption in a similar manner. So suppose we want to encrypt a message M that, to user A whose public key is of this form. So public key is gonna involve again, elliptic curve and two points on that curve. And I mean, we need a hash function which is secure in that case. And so in order to encrypt, what Bob's gonna do? Well, pick two integers, compute similar parameters, so elliptic curve and two points on it, compute the kernel, map to the common curve, and then he's gonna hash the J invariant and do an XOR of that result with message M and that's gonna be the cipher text. So, and then he's gonna send that with his public parameters that he has generated as a cipher text to A. Well, A after receiving this is gonna compute this, cur this point here, KBA, compute the curve, EBA, take the J invariant of it, hash it, and then decrypt the message by undoing the XOR that Bob has done. Okay. So what else can be done using elliptic curve isogenies? There's a number of other things. So here we just looked at the key exchange and public key encryption, but you can do also undeniable signatures. Uh, you can do strong designated verifier signatures. Uh, you can do entity authentication. Uh, we have authenticated encryption and integrated encryption. And much more is in progress and in successful progress. One of the major things that are, has been, uh, research has been done on in the elliptic curve isogeny area is actually doing uh, things similar to digital signatures. So we have undeniable, we have strong designated verifier signatures, but we need just the standard signatures as well. 
and there's quite a good progress being done there. Actually, some prototypes of the schemes already exist, but uh, we're just looking at the more efficient ones at this point. Okay, so why pick isogenies compared to other post quantum, as I already briefly discussed? Well, elliptic curve cryptography is well known in the study area, so it's been around for quite a lot of years, and people have an understanding of it. Um, now, another point is from implementation point of view, because we've been using elliptic curves for that many years, there's a lot of different implementation libraries out there. So we can actually reuse them for using EC because we're using, again, all our operations happening on top are just ECC operations, but the underlying part is the post-quantum resistant. So we can actually reuse a lot of libraries out there, just adding uh, some extra things to make sure that it accommodates the entire scheme. We have clear security parameters, we have mathematical proofs similar to most of the public key uh, schemes out there, so we reduce it, any scheme to a mathematically hard problem. Uh, we have short key sizes. So out of all the post-quantum candidates, elliptic curve isogeny-based schemes actually have the shortest keys and the smallest communication overhead. Okay, so timeline of required post-quantum solutions. When do we actually need it? Well, actually, right now, we need public key encryption, key agreement, authenticated encryption, and integrated encryption. So these things that are required in order for us to work today. The reason why I wouldn't need digital signatures just yet, because things that you need to sign and verify, you, well, if you sign it today, then you need to verify the person at that point was able to sign it. So if we don't have quantum computers yet, uh, it's not a problem. Digital signatures only needed when quantum computers actually come, but the public key encryption and key agreements and any types of encryption actually are needed today in order to be protected against quantum computers once they come or protect your messages for a long period of time. Uh, later, we'll also need anti-authentication, which we already have, and authentication-related blocks of any actual scheme. Okay, so what do we do with post -quantum, in order to integrate this into post-quantum PKI? Well, the certificate authority can perform entity authentication using isogeny-based schemes, so that step is fine. Uh, then quantum resistance signatures are needed closer to the emergence of large-scale quantum computers. And so today we have two options. Uh, we either just can use the classical schemes that we have at this point and wait until isogeny-based schemes will be ready to have digital signatures, or we can use hash-based signatures, which are great candidates for uh, post-quantum solutions as well. The only thing is that Hash-based signatures are only good as signatures that can't do anything else. And then we need to replace all the public key components, such as RSA or classical elliptic curve cryptography with isogeny-based components, and that can be done nicely. We actually, uh, I was at QCrypt conference just last week, and we've shown some VPNs who are already performing all these things, so it's a nice drop-in replacement. Works, you know, over, if you look overhead, we're looking, working in a very similar, like a Diffie-Hellman type of scenario, so we don't, we're exchanging some public information combined with our private information, generating common keys. So everything's working nice and fine, and uh, nice drop-in replacement. And for symmetric schemes, we just need to double the key length. And then, that way we're gonna get a post-quantum secure PKI in that way. All right, some summary and remarks and future development. So quantum computers are likely to become a reality within the next 15, 20 years. Uh, then we need to be protecting against quantum adversaries today, or maybe even yesterday, if we had some very uh, fragile information that needed to be encrypted. Uh, so the, but the protection must be not using quantum computers, but safe against quantum computers. That's why we need post-quantum cryptography. And some people are saying, well, ECC is one of the things that goes. Well, yes, classical ECC goes, but elliptic curves actually still survive using them in a different, as a different primitives. And the protection is available today, and it's already working, and it's out there, and we have the product totally ready with, this, with these schemes. And it's possible to replace all the classical components with quantum resistance solutions in PKI and other infrastructures as well. And that's already readily available to be done today. Research development standardizations and integrations are in progress and will continue. All right, thank you. Questions, comments? So, uh, 
a question, you said the, there is some implementations already. Can you tell us something about the performance, like uh, comparable to what are the existing algorithms? So for example, if we take a key exchange, it's under one second to establish a key. So it is maybe about 30 to 60 times slower than the standards that we have right now in classical ones, but it's still unnoticeable to the end user at that point. Because, I mean, the finite fields that we're working over are of larger size and because there's more computations involved. But this is something that's been improved uh, from day-to-day -day basis. And uh, so at this point, it's under a second to establish a key, for example, or to do an encryption. This all boils down that we will, 10 years from now, we will be still in business. Yep. <laughs> so it's good news, guys. <laughs> Yeah, do you think that we are in a hurry? Because uh, I, I cannot see any standards on, on this yet. So and many devices, a lot of things today does not support uh, ECC, uh, even though it's been available for ages. So do you think that we are in a hurry? Uh, yes, I think we are in a hurry. The thing is, uh, from classical side, even going from RSA to ECC, the, classic, the strength of classical computers has been gradually or linearly growing. So, you know, once computers become a little bit more efficient, yes, the scheme becomes a little bit less secure. So it's not as much of a problem there once you go from RSA to ECC or if you haven't gone to ECC on time because your security decreases by not by into a different category. With quantum computers, things are going to revolutionary change. So once they are there, it's not that the schemes are going to become weaker. They're just going to be totally weak, they're going to be broken, so therefore we need to protect against them. This is a different type of shift rather than, you know, improving classical computers. So therefore that's something that needs to be taken care of today. I mean, you know, if we look at like, say, SSL to TLS example, it takes quite a while to do all the transfers and that's why, you know, the earlier we start, the better it is. And I would, my personal view is that this thing should have been started maybe two, three years ago in order to be safe, but uh, it's still currently in development and, I mean, this year, uh, NSA and NIST all of a sudden started, you know, calling for proposals and saying that we need the transfer. So something might have happened as well. We don't know. 